right, the main point of this next example is to see, um, is to talk about um, storing data within an application. Uh, mobile applications are a little different than, than other applications. There's a lot of game or gamey type applications. Um, but still, in most applications, there's going to be the need to store data somewhere. And we already looked at one example of storing data. Um, let's see. I remember what assignment that was for you. I don't remember the example that we did. Hmm. Yes, the shared preferences. The assignment was with your rock, paper, and scissors. You needed shared preferences to make that work. I'm trying to think of what the example was. Favorite Twitter searches. Yeah. There you go. All right. That was one mechanism that we could use to store data within an Android application. I'm going to talk about four. And then the one we've already covered. And the other two I'm just going to mention. And then the last one is, of course, going to be the topic of, of today's example. So, shared preferences. is one mechanism. Another thing that we could do is we could do some sort of file output. I'm thinking like a comma, a comma delimited file or a tab delimited file. The last one we could do is sort of a cloud-based thing where we send a request up to a server to save data. And the last is with a SQLite database. I sort of have these arranged. Everything but this last one is more or less arranged in the level of, of um, complexity of data that it's capable of storing. The cloud, I suppose, is sort of a wild card. Uh, it's sort of a none of the above. It's sort of taking a strategy that we are not going to store anything local. We're going to store it out on the cloud. And in which case, all we're doing is we're making requests to the server to go and save some data. And as such, it sort of fits out of the spectrum of simple to complicated. Shared preferences involve essentially having what sometimes called a hash table, where you have a key that points to a value. And you can store primitives in this. All right. Actually, all these mechanisms that we're talking about would relate to storing primitives. There is a way that we can store objects. Um, and that would involve serializing them, but we're not really going to talk about that in this class. In a nutshell, serializing is sort of taking an object and sort of dehydrating it and sort of making like a flat file out of it. And then we can bring it to life and have our object anytime we want to. But other than just to mention it, we're not going to go into that in any detail. The other thing we could do is we could have a file output where we could actually create like records of data. Think about a hash table. Is a hash table is good for storing just some simple set of values, but if you're storing like values in a record, in other words, we wanted to store, let's say, about a person. We wanted to store their name, their address, their phone number, and so on. The shared preferences don't really lend themselves to that. A list of transactions, uh, a list of, a simple list of things, or sort of one element of each type, but where you have uh, like records where you have many people's addresses, many people's phone numbers and all that, doesn't really lend itself to shared preferences. We would have to write code to sort of make, take our data, our raw data, and turn it into a record and write it out to a file, then retrieve it and break it out into its uh, separate.
fields. SQLite database is the use of a simple relational database. And as I was thinking about this this morning, I was almost, I'm almost prepared to say, I would probably very rarely do this. Um, it's not as simple as shared preferences, and it's not as robust as the SQLite database. So if something was real simple, I'd use shared preferences. If something was a little more involved, I'd probably use the SQLite database. I guess that's an alternative that maybe you could find a use for, but uh, I'm trying to think like what would be the right sort of size of a problem to do that for. The cloud is sort of a different beast altogether. All and we're not going to talk about that because really, in the case of the cloud, we're not really storing the data on our device. We're simply taking data, making a request, similar to the way that you'd post a form in HTML, and send a request to the server, and the server would take it and do something with it and store it. And then we would make requests when we wanted to access that. The upside of this is... It makes our Android application simple because we don't have to worry about all that stuff. Now, someone has to be doing some work on the server side, of course, to make that work. Um, the upside is that, uh, again, we don't, we're not um, vulnerable to the limitations that we might experience uh, on a mobile device because we're sending it to a server somewhere. So, therefore, capacity and, and all that. Um, additionally, it has a drawback that the person would have to be connected to the web um, to access it if it's, if it's stored exclusively in the cloud. They would need to be, ha have a connection to the internet to retrieve it. This is more of a design issue if you're going to go with this one. You know, what is the functionality that you're trying to get out of your application? Something like Google Docs, for example, where the whole point of it is that you can store it and access it from any computer or any mobile device, then yeah, you have a cloud-based system. But something like my checkbook, for example, I wouldn't necessarily want that on the cloud, and I wouldn't necessarily want to be able to, uh, or, I'm sorry, be required to be connected to the internet when I want to enter a transaction. I want that transaction there, and I want to be able to enter it. So that's what we're going to look at in today's example. We've already covered this one. This one, I got to question the, the, the effectiveness of it. I suppose there's a place for it, so I'll mention it. And this one is probably, you know, we won't cover it all, or it's a topic for another day. So this is what our focus is going to be. And the example that we're going to go over is a, a simple address book example where we store bits of information about different people. Keep in mind that this is a sort of a demonstration application. Were we really wanting to do something like this, we probably would simply use the built-in address book in, in Android. Let's look at how this works first, then we will examine the code. This is a case of, might work on a technical level, but it's designed horribly because when you go into the application the very first time, you get a completely blank screen. So you have no idea what it is you're supposed to do. I remember like looking at this and like, you know, tapping it, stroking it, 
you have to access the menu. And from the menu, you can add a contact. So I'll click there to add a contact. And then I have my text boxes where I can enter the stuff in that I want to. So I'll enter in a few pieces of information. Then I can press the Save Contact and go to my information. If I want to edit it, I can touch it. It comes up. In a view-only mode, I can press then the menu and I can get Edit Contact or Delete Contact. Edit takes me right back into it. I can save it again. Delete, of course, will delete it. Do you want to take a look at it? Then we'll take a look at the code. at the manifest. Um, nothing earth shattering here other than the fact that we actually have two additional activities. All right. You, you can more or less think of an activity as a screen or a form or I guess screen's better than form because form implies a few things, but you can think of an activity as being like a screen that's presented to the user for you to do something. So you could almost count how many activities are there are based on how many different screens you got. Now, we've done sort of multiple screens before, but a lot of times we did that by um, like popping stuff up, like in an alert or, or other techniques. I don't think other than my camera example that we looked at last time that I still haven't 100% got working. Um, we haven't seen an application that has uh, multiple activities. In this case, there are three activities. The three activities being the initial activity, whereas we get the screen that contains a list of contacts, The screen that allows us to enter a contact. So the screen that shows a contact. The screen that allows us to edit a contact or view a contact. And the screen that allows us to, I keep hitting the wrong button here. The screen that allows us to edit a contact. These are three distinct activities. 
and as such they're represented that way. As you could more or less guess, if we look at our layout, we actually have three XML files. Each of them are for the corresponding um, activity. So we have the contact list, we have the view contact, and we have the add contact. Menu, we have two menus. We have the initial menu that comes up that allows us to add a contact, and then we have once you're viewing a contact, what menu you're going to see. Values, we have a con uh, combination of strings and styles. I'm not sure if we saw this done exactly this way before. Um, I know we've done things with uh, like putting the colors in an external file so that we could change the colors and we could change it everywhere without changing this. Not really sure we have um, seen styles here, but the, the concept is very similar to what you have with HTML. If you can put this in a separate file, then you can change it without um, affecting other things. So we're separating some of the, the, the aspects of the appearance out into a separate styles XML file that can then be applied to um, across different screens, across different activities. There actually is a border XML that consists of essentially the corners that are rounded. Where do we get that? We get that That's a good question. I'm trying to look to see is that? I don't know. Well we'll see in the application. Let's look at the source. Needless to say, most of what's interesting in this is going to relate to database stuff. All right. We have actually four objects, one for each of the activities, and one for um, the database connector. And let's look at that guy first and see what is in that. Really in that is all the code that relates to the database. Again, you, you see this, and, and I know that you're taking a couple, a couple of my classes, so um, you see this so much in programming. The idea of making a little component, making one thing, making one class or, or file or whatever you want to call it, that handles one aspect of it, handles one aspect completely, and then doesn't have to worry about anything else. And that has such a big... Uh, offers such big advantages as far as maintainability goes. It also allows a developer, when you're working on maintenance, to focus on one thing at a time, as opposed to having old school programs were sometimes called spaghetti code, where you'd have a bunch of stuff just sort of very much intertwined, and you had to be very careful um, where you messed with something, because if you, if you messed with the line of code, that's liable to have an unintended impact, where everything here is very modularized, and it's very much components. So the idea is I should be able to um, make a change to one without making, uh, without worrying uh, about the other. Here are a couple of instance variables here. One is the name of the database. 
One is the actual database itself, and the other is uh, a database open help helper. And we'll see where that open helper comes in. Because the problem is, is it's not easy to create a database. All right? Let me rephrase that. It's very easy to create a database if you use the object helper. Without using it, it it's, it's a little trickier. All right? And what does that database open help, helper do? If we look at the object down here, one of the methods that we have on this is on create. So let's imagine the very first time you try to access this database. For the very first time, we, we've installed the application, and the application is there, but the install procedure does not create the database. All right, so there's no database out there immediately after installing it. When we then go and run this application for the first time and try to open the database, tries to open it, this database open helper, sees it's not there. Because it's not there, it will run the onCreate method to actually go and create the, the, the database. And what do we do in the onCreate method? We execute all the statements that are necessary to create the tables that we want in the database. All right? So even if we were to create a empty database, we don't really want it quote, empty database, we want a database that has all the tables that we need. All right? Now, the nice thing about SQL is that there's actually instructions that we can use, provided we have the permissions, to create objects in the database. So you've done access, right? Some, you've done SQL Server at all? Okay, I haven't done SQL Server. All right. Typically for access, if you think about what you would want to do, you would, you would go in and you'd go through the GUI and click on create database and, or I'm sorry, create a table and give the table a name and then specify the columns and the attributes of that and so on. You know, you'd go and you'd create the, 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 the database table that way. Well, obviously in a case like this, there's no opportunity for this. We want the application to do it. All right. Really, behind that GUI, in Access or SQL Server or other tools, there's actually a data uh, definition language that's part of SQL that allows you to execute commands to create database objects. So I can create database tables, I can create keys, I can create foreign keys, I can create indexes. All these things I can create via a uh, an instruction that's just like a select statement or an insert statement or a update statement. Now, have you done insert update statements at all in databases? Okay. All right. Well, we'll take a look at that. Have you done select statements at all? In some queries? Yeah. Okay. All right. At any rate, this is a statement that creates the table that we need. Creates a table called contacts. It creates, as an integer primary key, auto increment, which is the same thing as an auto number in access, a column called ID. Then it creates name, email, phone number, street, and city. All as text fields. And then we go and we run that query, which runs out and creates that table. So the nice thing is then is this effectively sort of completes the install. By this creates a um, that this creates a structure in the database that we need. Now, in this case, all we're doing is we're creating one table. We could create multiple tables if we wanted to. We could create relationships between tables, uh, assuming SQLite permits that. We could actually insert data. Uh, one of my students last term was working on something where they wanted to initialize a database. In other words, when you installed and ran the application, they wanted the database to be pre-populated with some values. All right? So what we had to do there is we had to write more extensive code in this create 
uh, method to go in and not just create the empty tables, but create the tables and populate them with some data. In other words, we wrote some insert statements to go in and take data from somewhere and insert it into the, the database table. Now, the other method that, oh, we do see it. There's just no code on it. There's an upgrade method. And if you think about it, if we're enhancing our application, there's at least some kind of chance that we are going to be changing the database some way. In other words, we're going to be maybe adding a table or adding attributes or just in general changing things around. Well, if I've installed the version one of the application and then I upgrade it, let's say, to add a let's see what else could we add to this a birthday to the database all right of course we're not going to have any birthdays in there but we at least want to have that empty column in there so that we could start filling them in so what there would be is there'd be a statement in the on upgrade that would take the database from its current state and change it to um, the updated state. So for example, in our example, it would add a column, there'd be a statement to add a column to the contacts table for birthday. The only, I, I guess the only um, statement that I'm interested in is that we can create a database, but it is good to know that we can update a database. There's, there's, there's actually uh, a, a Along with the create statement, there's actually an alter statement that allows you to alter the structure of an existing database or table. So that's how we get the ball rolling. So in other words, the very first time I run this application, this runs, all right, and it creates the empty database. It creates the empty database with a, a single empty table called contacts. Now we'll be coming back to these other things as we look through the rest of the application. But essentially what we are doing is we've taken all the code related to the database and stuck it in this class. So this class is the, the database pipeline, if you will. So if we want data from the database, we ask this connector class or connector object for it. We don't write that code of our own. So there is code to do an insert. There is code to do a update. There is code to do a, a, a query to get all of um, all of the, the contacts from the contact database. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is code to retrieve one contact and finally, there's code to delete a contact. So really, everything that we want to do concerning the database lives here. The first thing we looked at, creating the database, that's in this class. But also is in this class is a query to give me all of our contacts, to give me one specific contact, to insert a contact, to update a contact, and delete it. We'll look at those separate functions as we run into them in the rest of the code. Let's look, though, at the address book class. We are doing the things that we typically do. We are um, creating um, references to this. We are using a list view in this, which is a little bit different than what we've done before. All right. I think in most of the examples before, when we had a um, when we had a, a list of things, we used a table and just inserted a table row. Here, we're using a list view, which is which is a different kind of view. Associated with this list view is what's called a cursor.